people that are here, the people that aren't, we praise God that they'll get well or whatever. So, Lord, we just praise Him for, for today, one day at a time. So, <clears throat> the verses today of Scripture, God's Word, is Jude, verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the presence and beyond all time, so be it. I'm smiling really big under here. Can you tell? <laughs> Not a clue, do you? I told the clerk in the store the other day, I said, it's so fifty, you can't tell when people are smiling. Mm -mm. Now you know what I'm doing? I'm sticking my tongue out and you don't even know it. <laughs> okay, I'm past six feet from you. So what do you think about wearing a mask? What do, you th <clears throat> what do you think about living a different life than the world around you. It's what we're called to do. We're called to live a set-apart, holy life where people see us and don't say, well, I know you go to this church over here. They say, I know you're like Jesus Christ because of not what you say, but because of what you do. So I'm going to challenge you to wear a mask in this time period. We're supposed to not gather together more than 10 people right now in stage two. There is a mask mandate for the panhandle, and most people won't wear one. The reason that they won't wear one, and I'm not going to preach politics today, I'm just starting with this, is because I don't need to. I don't see the reason in it. I, 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 I. But aren't we all supposed to be about each other rather than myself? Aren't we supposed to be about Jesus instead of my life? Jesus, God's one and only Son, all majesty, glory, and honor to Him as Jude wrote in that ending doxology because Jesus gave up His life to save me. Why would I not consider others over my own needs? Why would I try to cling to and hold on to my own life? Why would I not give it all to the one who gave it all to me? We're here for this first week of, of the Advent season. We'll be talking about hope. We'll also be reviewing some of the things that we've read. And as you go into Revelation, don't look for all the answers. That's not why God came, or Jesus came to John and gave him this revelation. It was because we're going to have to go through a lot of hard times a lot of trials and testing of our faith before the fact that Jesus Christ returns to gather his own. But there is hope. No matter how bad situations look, how much hope looks like it's not in the picture, just as Jesus Christ came the first advent to a world that was conquered by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is the, the, the thing that helped the gospel spread. There was a road system. There was one language but it was the darkest time for the history of Israel. They haven't, hadn't heard from a prophet in years until John the Baptist came out and, and announced the, the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus Christ will return to carry his own back to heaven with him, will forever be with him. But it may look like the darkest, bleakest time when there is no hope. But as Christians, we always have complete confidence that Jesus loves us, and that if we believe and trust in Him, we will spend all eternity with Him. Let's start with prayer. 
Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, awesome God. Lord, we thank you for your holiness and righteousness. We thank you that you are the perfect judge, perfectly balancing love and mercy and grace with justice. Father, we thank you that Jesus did come and will come again. We thank you that you have um, decided to live inside of us, that we have an advocate living in us, the Holy Spirit, and we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, in heaven, and that we know without a doubt, if we believe in Jesus Christ, that we will spend eternity with you. Lord, help us to face this world, anything that life has to throw at us, any doubts and insecurities, and Lord, also besides that, teach us to be more like Jesus each and every day. Sanctify us through and through so that we can be like Christ in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I got you an early Christmas present. And it is masks. Okay? And I'll mention a little bit more. But what a way to talk about Jesus if you didn't notice, mine said Jesus saves. I've got these that say Jesus is my Savior. And I've got these. <laughs> this is for my wife, not you. That say, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9. Now, I've been wearing this Jesus Saves ones a little bit, and I still don't remember to, to get it and carry it all the time, but I try to. And it brings up discussions about Jesus. Can you believe that? Because I like your mask. Oh, I do too. Or why are you wearing a mask? Well, Corona might get me, but Jesus will save me. Just like it says, whatever it is to start a, a conversation. You are the light of the world. And how people see that light is how you shine in your good deeds so it glorifies your Father that's in heaven. Right now is a time when people are divided, discouraged, without hope, tired of this crap. Can I say that from up here? I hope I can. I did. And we need to bring hope, love, joy, and peace because we have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord I wish things weren't this way I'm so tired of this but it's something we're going to face and everybody's like well I'll be glad when 2020 is over just wait to see what 2021 <laughs> has to offer I was reading Beth's newsletter today and she can't come back here to visit unless she doesn't go back to Romania at all. The people there have to wear masks. They do wear masks because they don't get a mandate that comes out or an ordinance or whatever you say, and the first thing you do is the local officials say, we're not going to enforce it. <laughs> what does that tell this world? We may be going into a time of anarchy. I don't know. I know what I'm reading in Revelation, and again, I don't want you to look at trying to find all the answers, because give me five minutes and I can confuse you on what you think your answers are. Study God's Word to be an approved workman. And we don't have to know, and we won't know all the answers, but we have the Spirit of God living inside of us where we will be witnesses. So we need to use this time to not be scatterers but gatherers for the kingdom because of how much we love others and they see that love in and through us so this is the first week of advent advent if you don't know it means coming it's the coming of a notable one and we are looking forward to we are eager to that but let's go back in israel's history they were eager for the messiah to come but the messiah that did mighty miracles by the hand of God, by the finger of God, signs, as John said, so that you might believe. They chose not to believe. Why? Because it's not the kind of Savior I want. I. I want one that's going to stop this oppression. These things are going to go away. I want a pre-trib rapture. I'll go there for a term. 
because I don't want to have to go through the tribulation. And I want to use a verse that says that God won't pour his wrath out on the ch my children. But as you read, and I'm just doing this to confuse you already, as you read, Jesus talks about one time that he comes again. So maybe a post-trib rapture looks more like the truth. We don't need to go, don't worry. <laughs> we don't need to worry about all those things. What we know is that we have hope that Jesus Christ will return. Whether I have to get out of this place before the tribulation, mid-tribulation, or after tribulation, why would I care? I know that by the blood of the Lamb that I will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. And as we read through all the letters we've read through, and if you've been reading your Bible, you have read everything in the New Testament except for Revelation. If you read, you will notice that every letter pretty much addressed a problem in the church because we fight a spiritual battle. And people from even within the church were trying to discourage you, to, to, to draw you away from the truth, to make you ineffective for the kingdom. Jude, basically Jude is going to write a letter of the joy that we have in our salvation. And instead he says, I've got to write this quick letter to you to tell you there are people inside of your own church that the New Living Translation says they've wormed your way in the church. They sit and eat with you in your fellowship dinners and everything, and they're telling you it's okay to go on sinning and still be saved. Not only sinning, but since it's all about me again, these other guys are going to visit the temple prostitutes. I still want to live in the flesh and want that. So I am taking my body and sinning with my body, which Scripture talks so much about. Why in the world, if we're married... To Jesus Christ would we want to be married to the devil at the same time there is no communion with light and darkness if you believe that you are fooling yourself and that's what Jude says and that's what Paul says and that's what James says and that's what Peter says because it's a constant problem in the church and just because you're saved doesn't mean the devil's not going after you just start wearing that mask and see how much the devil goes out after you because you're proclaiming Jesus Christ. Even if you don't open your mouth, you're proclaiming Jesus Christ. So I've got a mask for everybody, and, and this one's pretty neat because it's even got two filters that come with it. So you slide a little filter in here. And they're pocketed. This one is like this one where they, let me turn it right side up, where they do fit good on your, on your face. There's no real openings here or anything. Fits good. And they might work and they might not work. This one says Jesus saves. And they might work and they might not work. But this works. Jesus does save. And that little message, whether you open your mouth or not, may speak volumes to that person that you came in contact with just coincidentally, randomly, no, maybe that God put them in your path simply to see this message today because that's the two words that they needed to hear today. I don't know, but I know that wherever I go, I'm going to proclaim Jesus Christ because he is my Lord. And Scripture says that if I believe in my heart and profess with my mouth, and I am even if I'm not speaking there, that Jesus Christ is Lord then I'll be saved. And just maybe, just maybe, others will hear that as well, whether I verbally speak it or not. But I better live a life that shows I'm not a hypocrite. Because even though God's words will go out, the rocks will cry out, Scripture says, if I don't. They will go out and they won't be void. But the thing is, is I might miss heaven that day. Because Jesus does say that many will cry out on that day, Lord, Lord. But he says, depart from me, I did not know you. And then they try to state their claim. We did mighty miracles in your name. And he says, depart from me. That's it. That's simple. They look like what Christians should look like. They might have felt like what Christians feel like. I don't know but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
So therefore they didn't have a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit did not reside in them, which Jude says in this chapter. And they will spend an eternity apart from God. No matter how good they were, no matter how many miracles they performed, it's all about your relationship with your Savior and Lord. So Jesus came His first advent, and He will come again, because that's what He promised. And in the meantime, He showed us how to live, and He told us how to live. And He said, if you love Me, you will obey My commandments. Plain and simple. So what are Jesus' commandments? You've read them in the Gospels. You've read them in the letters. You know that you're supposed to live a holy, sanctified, set-apart life where you don't live for your own desires anymore, but you live for the kingdom, for others. That you're fishing for men, not fishing for things. And it's so easy to get distracted in this country. Reading that letter of Beth's again made me think, and I did a little research yesterday because I, I want to go travel because Sherry and I normally go to some warm, sunny place that, you know, between November and December. And I got points that if I don't use, we'll still lose even though they're COVID. And we might go somewhere. We might not. You can go to Hawaii and you can take a test beforehand. And as long as you test negative, you can go. You got to do it within 72 hours. So we might go. I don't know. I'm, I'm in dilemma about it. Wearing masks and going, maybe. But Hawaii is part of this country, again. Romania, totally different. I looked at going to Mexico, and I can go to Mexico. I can fly. I can't drive across the border. But their resorts are at 15 to 25% capacity. Well, that sounds great for me. I, I go to the pool and there won't be that many people there. But let's think about this whole thing. They don't have a country like we do. That means that 75% of the people that work in these resorts, which are the bulk of the income for the country, have been sent home. No way to feed their families. They're not getting stimulus checks. They're wondering where the hope is in this world. And I'm just giving you two examples based off a letter from someone that we know that is in Romania and from what little bit of research I've done in Mexico. And we want to complain that we got to wear a mask. So we don't because it's not a law. What defines the difference then? If it was a law, do you think more people would wear them or you would say the same? It's not going to be enforced. Why do you think so many people speed? What about all the other things people do in darkness? And they won't come out of the darkness because they're afraid the light will expose them. They need hope that you and I have. And the only way they're going to have that hope is if we live a life like Jesus. Christian, little Christ, like Jesus. That's what it literally means. So do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Not head knowledge, but heart knowledge. And is He your Lord, not just your Savior? Christmas. What does Christmas mean? A lot of people don't know in this, in this country. Chris Mass. It's the death of Christ. We celebrate His birth. We celebrate His birth because in His first advent, He had a purpose. He came to die for you and I to save us. And His own people recognize Him not. He fulfilled so many prophecies. He did so many miracles by the hand or finger of God. And yet they didn't recognize Him because it's not the, He was not the Savior that I wanted. And it cost him everything. And he calls for it to cost you to follow him. But so many people aren't willing to do that again because they really just want a Savior, not a Lord. But Scripture's clear, you've read it, that you can't have a Savior without a Lord. And if you have a Lord, then you will love Him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And 
you will love others as yourself. Isn't that what Scripture says? And even the teacher that asked him that to question him, Jesus said, go and do that. You can't just believe it and not do it. You have to do it. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So what do you believe? You've got to read God's word. You've got to study his word. Don't just sit here in 2021 and say, well, I read through the New Testament. I'm good for a while. Keep reading. Keep studying. I'll figure out a reading plan and, and throw it out there to you. But even if I don't, you read and you study God's word so you rightly know how to handle the word of truth. I'm going to just tease with you again for a minute. Rapture. The United States pretty much thinks because of teaching that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Now, don't throw stones at me. <laughs> but I give you verse after verse after verse that don't show that. I give you some verses that I can use to prove that also. Just like you can give me verses to justify what you're saying. If you read in 1 Thessalonians, and I'm going to pick on Merle, and we'll probably get to that, because we didn't cover a lot of these in Sunday morning. But in 1 Thessalonians, or maybe 2 Thessalonians, don't remember what it is right now, it basically says if a man doesn't work, he won't eat. And you've heard that so many times. Talked about about unbelievers. If you read that, you'll know clearly that Paul's writing to the church, and he says there are these scoundrels that's come into the church, and they say, I'm better than you, or whatever it is. So they're sitting there saying, hey, you go do all this work for me. You feed me, you clothe me, you, you take care of my nails and whatever. <laughs> and he's saying, those guys are scoundrels. If they won't work, they don't need to eat. It doesn't apply to the outside world. It doesn't apply to that at all. Now, can you take that verse and apply it? Maybe, maybe not. But then you need to look at the doctrine throughout the Bible. And as you read more and more there, you're going to find out that, that Jesus says... They have you. That's what he told his disciples. I'm leaving, but they have you. If you go back to the Old Testament and look at the things that were designed there to protect the poor and everything else, and no justification, again, of why they were in that state, you won't find that. What you'll find, even when you look at the, the story of the rich man who wanted to build bigger barns because he had the crops, Jesus said, basically, you should have been rich to others. There's no justification there on who you're rich to. And we don't do it so for our own praise. We do it so that they can see God's love. So when you reach out to somebody who's in a situation that they put themselves into, you know they put themselves into, but you still love them anyway, that really gets them to question why you behave that way. And it points back to Jesus. I behave that way because Jesus gave me what I didn't deserve. He died for my sin and my shame. So that I would not face God's wrath. And he gave me new life so I could live now for him instead of my own desires and then live eternally with him. What greater testimony, what greater Bible story than a person whose life is changed and they live for Jesus. So as a child of God, if that's who and what you are, and you believe the gospel and you've read the gospel, how should you live? I'm not going to answer those questions for you. You know, you've read them. You've read how you should live, and you've seen all these letters that tell the church, hey, I'm proud of you, but we're going to go into Revelation. And Jesus writes seven letters to the churches. And in five out of the seven, he says, well, not in five out of seven, because a couple of them, he says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But five out of seven say there's a problem here in the church. Wow. Only two out of seven get a, you done well. Isn't that what we're supposed to be living for? Well done, my good and faithful servant. 
Aren't we supposed to be building up treasures in heaven where moth do not come in and thieves do not come in and steal? Isn't that how we're supposed to live? If, in fact, you have hope that you have eternal life, many will cry out on that day. Not a few, not some. Many, Lord, Lord. And the thing about that, again, it just, oh, it makes chills down my spine is those many were doing mighty things for Jesus. How many more out there were going to church regularly? Or how many more were tithing? Or how many more said, oh yes, I believe in God, and I'm okay. I'm not really doing anything, but I know I'm okay because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. But they're not living for King Jesus. How many more that day will not get eternal life, but will receive God's wrath because their sin has not been taken away from them? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's our job, if you truly believe, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, and to love others as ourself. Hope, faith, joy, and peace should be obvious in our lives. I want to read a little bit from Romans 8. You can turn there if you want to. I know that's not what we've read lately, but Romans 8 basically is the chapter that talks about the most of any one chapter, how you should live by the Spirit of God if, in fact, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, starting in verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. We could stop right there. But if you belong to Jesus Christ because you've put your faith and trust in Him, you're not condemned anymore. Woohoo! Let's live like that we believe that. Amen. Verse 2 And because you belong to Him, the power of the life giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now not only that, but the Spirit of God lives in me. Is He living through me? Is there evidence that the Spirit of God is living in me? Verse 3, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. Well, I'm not a bad person. I don't sin regularly. I don't sin a, a, a lot. How many times do I grumble and complain, which is what the children of Israel did, and the death angel came among them? How many times do I grumble and complain simply because the weather's not what I wanted to do today and I had this plan? Hmm instead of thanking God that I had breath of life today, that my body functioned. And then I asked him, what have you put in my path today to be a witness for you? I'm going to tell you, I probably sin each and every day in that aspect. And then I say something I shouldn't say to my wife. <laughs> anyway, we won't go down that path. <laughs> And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Spirit as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead we follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind lives to life and peace. What controls your mind, your thinking process, what I'm living for, whose life mine belongs to, why was I created, why do I have breath today instead of not having breath today? Because I have my life to give to the one who gave his life for me. Verse 7, or I, don't, I don't think I finished 6, did I? No, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. 
For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. So is, or is your life being controlled by the Spirit of God? And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your mortal body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, that means He's and coming to a conclusion with what he's just previously written. It, written, Dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful na uh, nature urges you to do. What did my sinful nature urge me to do before? I wasn't a murderer. I wasn't a thief. I stole some erasers in school. It still bothers me today. <laughs> they were car erasers. They were cool. They had different kinds. Stole from the bookstore at the Christian school and then got to feeling bad and stopped and then the other two boys that were stealing, I mean, they got caught. <laughs> Your sins will find you out. And they found me out too because they ratted on me. But anyway, that doesn't matter. I quit because this conscience in me. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit at that time. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was leading up to salvation. We have a conscience that teaches us right from wrong. But without a Savior, like Scripture says here, we will continue to do wrong. But if we've been born again, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Romans 12, when we go in there, says that the Holy Spirit will transform and renew our way of thinking to where we were like a caterpillar to a butterfly. So drastic difference. You can't tell me that no one doesn't notice that the butterfly doesn't look like the caterpillar anymore. Do you look so radically different than you did before? So, if you were a good person, great. If you're a bad person, yeah, you've got this testimony. I was on the side of the tracks here and I'm here now. But if you were a good person, how much more loving do you need to be and considerate of others now? Because you were good before. Be like Christ now, if in fact the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by it, its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, not just get them less, but put them to death, totally sanctified through and through, then you will live. Verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So if you, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father. For, the spirit, for His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are His children, we are heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share His glory, we must also share His sufferings. How many times in the letters did we find that the church is suffering because of what they believe? And how many times in all those letters do we see Paul or Jude or whoever it is writing back, I know you're suffering, but think about the hope that you have. Think about how Jesus Christ suffered for you. Even consider the sufferings that you're facing, pure joy that you can suffer with Jesus. Because of the eternal hope that you have. What's the first thing that we want to do when sufferings come along? Why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? Rather than, what opportunity can I use? Okay, so I need to wear a mask now? Oh, I will gladly wear one and I'll put on it something about Jesus so that the world sees that. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't like wearing it at all. I didn't wear one before the mandate, but since the mandate's here, I want to abide by it. And I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm going to give you a mask and I'm saying to wear them if you will. I'm shepherding you as Jesus is shepherding me, plain and simple. That means caring for 
going after the lost sheep. That means feeding for. That means making them lie down if necessary. It means you have a shepherd's staff that's a hook where you can draw them back, but you also have a rod if you need to pop them. No offense. <laughs> or you can pop the wolves at their door and everything. And as we can see, there are wolves in sheep clothing through all, throughout the church. I am so thankful that there's not much of that here. I can't say there's none. Sometimes I'm a wolf myself in sheep's clothing when I'm not doing what God wants me to do. And what, if I'm not acting like Christ, what am I? Anti-Christ. Ooh. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 18, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who His children really are on that day. Verse 20, Against its will, all creation was subject to God's curse, but with eager hope. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste, just a taste of future glory. We long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as His adopted children, including the new bodies He has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already, had, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something that we don't have, we must wait patient and confidently. Do you have hope, complete and utter confidence? that you are a child of God, that you will inherit the kingdom of God because you are a brother or sister of Jesus Christ. Does He live in you? Are you producing works that show the repentance that came when you changed your way of thinking? It's all about me. This is my life to live. Today is what I'm going to do today. Versus it's whatever God calls me to do today. So many times we think with our own mind process still, even as a Christian, i got a job, I don't have time to, to do this today when I see this need. I've got family I need to take care of first. Uh, these finances are, are required over here for this. That's thinking with your mind. I'm not saying it's bad but think by the Spirit who combines with your spirit to lead you and guide you in the way, the truth, and the life. The first Christians, they were called Christians at first in Antioch because they were acting like Christ, but most of them simply were called people who followed the way because the pattern that they lived was set apart and different than the world around them. They had a king. His name was Jesus. And they lived differently than the world. As we're in Jude, we see that some of them were being misled by their own people, that they could still go and sin. Some of them weren't. And that's why Jude had the, this urgency to write this letter and say, you can't live this way. And, and Jesus is going to say this next week as we read Revelation, where he says, you started out so well, what happened? And so that's why Jude wrote this letter, to get them back on the right path. And he even says to have mercy on those who are believing these things. But be careful, I'm towards the end of Jude now, so that you don't fall in the trap with them to love them and have compassion for them and study and stand firm in God's Word and realize that we're here to build each other up. We're all parts of a body. And I need each and every part of the body, Jesus does, for His church to work effectively. Jesus will come again. Period. The difference is... is where are you going to be when He comes? 
I can give you scripture after scripture after scripture, but the scripture I'm thinking about right now is when Jesus says that he's coming again and he takes those sheep with him and separates the goats. And the thing that distinguishes each of them is the things they did while they were in the body. And they both cry out and say, when did we see you hungry, Lord? When did we see you thirsty? When did we clothe you, Lord? The simple things that we're supposed to provide, but we get so caught up in this materialistic world that one of the worst things right now is, I don't want to wear a mask. Where other countries are really, really suffering economically everything else. We still have a lot of hope. <laughs> We still have a lot of freedom. We've just got some things we don't like. And if that's suffering, <laughs> praise God that that's all we're suffering. Look at the opportunities to show others. And then as Peter says, if they see your life, they see your hope, then maybe they'll ask you. And then you have that opportunity to tell them about Jesus Christ. But unless you're living like Jesus does live inside of you, then your testimony is not going to mean a thing. At least the words will still get out if you wear the mask. God will still save, but He wants to use you and I. That's why He gave us new life. That's why we, when we simply believe we don't just die and go to heaven then. We've got a ministry to do on this earth. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we're called to suffer if that's what it takes to present the gospel message. So if we're not suffering that much, then I think what Jesus is probably going to ask us is why did you waste the opportunity that I gave you? That's just what I think. Jude ended his little letter after telling you to be merciful and draw others back from the flames, the ones inside the church even, he ended with these words, Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away, and will bring you, bring you with great joy into His glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to Him, who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are His before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. That's the verses Jude concluded with. Wow, what a powerful short sermon right there that is. All praise, glory, and honor to God because He sent Jesus Christ. Is this the hope that you have? So these are all yours. You can sanitize your little hands. If you're not going to wear one, don't take one. Okay? If I don't have enough, I'll order more. I ordered what I could order from Amazon and get it in here this week. So that's why I had to do a little bit of, of each type. But these are yours if you will wear them. If you don't, don't. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. In any way that I can proclaim God's word, I look at this as a, a perfect opportunity. You see me wear my Jesus shirts and stuff all the time. Now I get to wear a mask, which is a, is a conflicting thing in this country. And I get to tell them, well, there's no conflict in Jesus. He saves He's my Savior. There's no conflict there. There is only life, hope, joy, and peace. So I hope and pray that as we approach Christmas, as we go through this Advent season, as you share with relatives, as you come in contact with other people, that they see Jesus Christ in you. Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a mighty, holy God a God of loving compassion. You are also a God of justice and holiness, and we praise you. We thank you that you poured out your love when you called us 
to belong to you through the suffering and death of your Son. Lord, we thank you for empowering us by your Spirit to live holy, set-apart lives. Lord, help us to do this each and every day. Help us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow after Jesus. Lord, we do thank you in this country that we have so many freedoms, that, that we are so, so blessed by you. And as we see in Revelation, if things get much, much worse... Let us rely on the hope that we have to get through these troubled times and to profess our love for others because you first loved us. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.